Okay. Um, welcome to uh, Berkeley. Uh, this is George Lakoff. Uh, I'm at the MetaNet project at uh, the International Computer Science Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and I'd like to greet all the folks in Sarajevo at the conference. I wish I could be there, um, but, uh, you know, I'm prevented for reasons beyond my control. So what I want to do is present uh, a brief uh, overview with some examples of a book in progress with Sweeney and Ryan and called How Brains Think. And the basic idea is this. Uh, we want to start with an outline here of uh, old and new theories of reason. That is, uh, theories of reason from the 17th century, the old ones, and 21st century theories of reason. Go on to uh, embodied cognition. Go through the early examples from the 1970s and how we would explain them today. Um, then go through, uh, and in the pro course of that, talk a little bit about neural circuitry for doing that. Then go through association circuitry, which links embodiment to other forms of embodiment, uh, that is embodiment in language, in gesture, uh, and so on, uh, linked to uh, embodiment of thought. Then uh, I want to go to the issue of how abstract concepts are embodied. How, can, how do they get embodied? And the claim is they're embodied via metaphor circuitry. And then um, the, finally, an explanation of embodied cognition experiments, which have become very uh, popular around the world. So with that, let's start. The old theory of reason uh, started around 1650 uh, in the era of Descartes. It's still taught today. And there's a new account of reason from neurocognition, cognitive linguistics, neuroscience, experimental co uh, embodied cognition, and computational neuroscience all put together combined in a field of neurocognition. Uh, the old theory goes like this. It assumes that thought is conscious. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, assuming that thought was conscious. Uh, it turns out that it's not exactly right. We'll get to that in a minute. The old theory assumed that thought was abstract, that it wasn't physical. Uh, Descartes reasoned that if thought were physical, the laws of physics uh, would uh, constrain how you could think. Uh, thought is physical, as we'll see, and it is constrained. Uh, the old view saw that emotion got in the way of reason, and sometimes it does, uh, and, but it turns out that's usually not the case uh, here. We'll talk about that. Reason was assumed to be and use mathematical logic. Uh, Descartes, after all, was a mathematician, and the assumption is that reason is logical with some uh, normal use of uh, mathematical logic, whatever that might be. Uh, the assumption further was that reason is literal, that it could directly fit the world. Descartes asked if it's abstract, how could it fit the world? And he had a clear answer to that, um, God wouldn't lie to us. Uh, then there was an assumption that reason is what makes us human. We're rational animals after all, therefore it's universal. It's part of what defines humanity, that we all have the same reason. Seven, there's an idea that ideas can be understood by anyone. If we're rational animals, then we should be able to understand any uh, idea at all, if we all have the same form of reason. Uh, next, there's a view that words are defined by conditions of truth in the world then that language is cognitively neutral, since it's defined by truth in the external world. All of that is very common, and in fact, uh, when I went to college, that was what I was taught, not in terms of this list as so much, but assumed to be true. The new account of reason, what I'll call real reason, is very different. Uh, we think with our brains. We don't have a choice. That's how it goes. Some people may think that political leaders think with other parts of their anatomy, but um, we think with our brains, and so do they. Uh, all thought is physical. It's carried out by neural circuitry. Uh, most thought, the usual assumption is around 98%, is unconscious. Even when you're thinking consciously, it's unconscious. Uh, Danny Kahneman is not quite right when he says that there is system two thinking, which is slow and conscious and doesn't have any of the unconscious fast the system one thinking. Uh, when you're thinking slowly and consciously, the unconscious is mostly at work. 
And it has to be. Why? Because unconsciously what's happening in the brain is we have neural uh, structures going in many, many different directions uh, all at once, uh, doing lots and lots of complex work uh, having to do with embodiment and we, as we will see. And uh, consciousness is linear. So consciousness being linear and kind of slow is not able to do what is going on in hundreds of parallel structures in the brain. So you have no choice, it's mostly unconscious. Next, you can only understand what the neural circuitry in your brain allows you to understand. You can't understand just anything. And this uh, particularly is the case in political reasoning, which I've written a great deal about. But it's true in many other things as well. It's true in the academic world. Some people uh, still believe in enlightenment reason, can only think in terms of that in the 17th century view. And the idea that, they could, that one could think in other ways and that one does think in other ways, mostly unconsciously, is something a lot of people, even in the academic world, can't comprehend and don't make sense of. Uh, next, emotion turns out to be necessary for reason, and T Tony Damasio showed this uh, in the book called Descartes' Error. Uh, he looked at people who had brain injuries and strokes who, who could not feel and uh, didn't have emotion. And if, you, if that's the case, then like and not like don't mean anything. That means you cannot set goals and act rationally if you don't know what would be good and what would be bad and what other people would think would be good and bad for you. So it turns out that people who have those brain injuries kind of act randomly and mess up their lives. And rationality, therefore, requires emotion in order to set goals. Now, meaning on our account, the account I'm going to give here in terms of neural computation and uh, is embodied simulation. That is, you're constantly in simu uh, simulating ideas uh, and what's going on in the world with your embodied thought. There's no single logic. One of the things, I studied logic for a long time and worked on it for a long time. If you go to read the logic journals, logicians have constructed thousands of logics which are substantively different. Uh, they have different inferences, different assumptions, and so on. There is no one logic. Uh, however, we do think in terms of cognitive primitives, frames, metaphors, and narratives, and each of those has its own logic different from each other, and interestingly and importantly different. Then there's a very interesting phenomenon in frame semantics, which we'll get to, which is that when you negate a frame, it activates the frame. The famous example was Richard Nixon uh, in uh, the Watergate case got up and said, I am not a crook, and everybody thought of him as a crook. When you argue against an argument point by point, what that does is create support for the argument you're arguing against because you're uh, activating those views of the world that you're arguing against and therefore you're supporting the argument you're arguing against. That's a very important thing to know. Next, uh, we are going to argue that abstract concepts are embodied via metaphor. Otherwise, there is no account of the embodiment of abstract concepts. How do abstract concepts get their meaning? The answer for concrete concepts is going to be via embodiment, which makes sense for physical things like jumping or running or physical objects like desks or chairs. But um, it, uh, you know, abstract concepts have to be treated in some other way. And we're going to argue that it's via metaphorical circuitry. Finally, uh, we're going to talk about Charles Fillmore's discussion of words being defined relative to frames. There is no such thing as a neutral word. It's all, they're all frame dependent. And grammatical constructions are based on common embodied experiences. So given all of that, what follows? Well, let's look at where embodied cognition came from in the 1970s, the early examples, and what has happened since then in modern explanations. First, color categories. Back in 1977, uh, Paul Kay gave uh, a remarkable and published a remarkable paper. Uh, one of the things that was discovered in the neuroscience of color is um, what any neuroscientist will understand is there are no colors in the external world. They're not there. You look out, it looks like there's green and red and blue and so on out there. Uh, 
But colors are created in four ways. They're reflected wavelengths from objects, but wavelengths, individual wavelengths, are not colors. There's nearby lighting conditions, which affects what you see in terms of color. And then there's what's inside you. There are color cones in the retina and neural circuitry connected to those, and those all together create color. Now, what's interesting about this is that men and women don't have the same kinds of color cones necessarily. Uh, men, have, because color cones are genetically connected, and your uh, men have two different kinds of color cones that are very close. Uh, women have 16 types of color cones, not each woman, but uh, across women there are 16 types, which can differ very considerably. One of the reasons why uh, women have a larger color vocabulary than men if they're going to talk to each other. Moreover, uh, if you've ever had arguments across gender as to whether something was orange or brown or whether it's green or blue, uh, what happens is you're both right because you can have different color cones giving you rise to different experiences of color. Color is a, a, can, is a concept that has to do with your connection to the world, your relationship with it, with, with your body. It's an embodied concept. And there's a recent discovery that about 3% of women have four kinds of color cones. They have a kind of uh, whole dimension of color that the rest of us cannot even see. Uh, I suspect my wife is one of them. Uh, she's a, an artist uh, specializing in color. Now, uh, then the great discovery uh, by Eleanor Roche was, of, was basic level concepts. What she pointed out was that concepts like chair or car and other basic level concepts are defined by motor programs. You sit in a chair, you drive the car like this, etc. And gestalt perception, you can pick out a car at a distance, you can pick out a chair at a distance, no problem. Uh, and you can have mental imagery. You can get a mental image of chairs and cars and so on. Once you go higher than that for general notions like furniture and vehicles, you don't have uh, mental images of general uh, forms of furniture that are neutral between chairs, beds, tables, lamps, and so on, uh, or between cars, planes, boats, trains, and so on. You don't have mental images at that higher level. So these three ideas come together. Well, why should they? Why should that ever have happened? Well, we now know why. Uh, we know from the work at Parma in the 1990s that there's mirror neuron circuitry that connects uh, the motor programs you use to uh, your perception, visual and auditory perception in the parietal cortex. And therefore, there's a certain kinds of uh, neural circuitry that will be active when you either perform an action or you see someone else perform the same action. That is, there's a connection between uh, first person and third person perception. Then you have the discovery uh, by Martha Farah and others that uh, imagination and action and perception use the same parts of the brain. So what's happening is you have a common form of neural circuitry that links together gestalt perception and motor programs uh, and mental imagery, all in one uh, 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 part of the brain, part, various parts of the brain linked together, uh, and that's what gives rise to basic level concepts. We have an explanation for why they should exist. Next, there are cognitive primitives, and uh, these uh, include aspectual structures and image schemas. Um, and this is important. Let's start with the uh, uh, um, first schema structure in general. Uh, when you have a schema, like um, a schema for containment, where you have uh, a uh, boundary, an interior, and an exterior, you have various semantic roles. And you have a whole structure with various roles that are involved in that as substructures. Uh, and lots of schemas work this way. All frames work this way. They have semantic roles and so on. And those can be explained, as Jerry Feldman has pointed out, by what are called gestalt circuits. They're circuits that, uh, such that any role activates the entire gestalt. There's a, a node, uh, a neural ensemble for each of those. And then the entire gestalt activates all of the roles. And that's what a gestalt circuit is. And all of the um, structure of schemas in general works by gestalt circuits. Gestalt circuits do other things as well as we'll see.
Then there are XNets, uh, which are processing circuits and topographic map structures uh, that are important. Now, um, the idea here with uh, XNets, we'll get through that in a while, uh, is that they are uh, circuits that carry out actions in the world. Uh, and topographic map structures, what we call map architectures, are combinations of topographic maps and they compute image schemas. So the idea is this. Every uh, semantic role in an image schema is a single map in a map architecture. Image schemas were uh, discovered by Ronald Laniker and uh, Len Talmy back in the 1970s. And what they found was that the same primitive structures occur in language after language, and they're put together differently in different languages. Those primitive structures include things like uh, motion with a source, a path, a goal, and a trajectory that moves, and so on. Uh, they include containment, they include rotation, they include uh, bodily things like fronts and backs and uh, notions like beside and sides and all sorts of other structures that show up in uh, the spatial re uh, relations in the world. Uh, Laniker uh, originally talked about what he called space grammar, that is the grammar based on spatial relation structures. And uh, that is a very important discovery, it's real. And what we're going to argue is that they are explained by topographical, uh, topographic map architectures, uh, where each semantic role in an image schema is a single map in a map architecture. Now let's talk a little bit about nets, and, uh, X nets and aspect. Srini Narayanan, back in uh, his 1997 dissertation, pointed out <coughs> that in order to move, in order for the, the premotor cortex to coordinate actions, the premotor cortex is a kind of choreographer. It, uh, chore it, it uh, choreographs actions and then sends uh, uh, activation to the motor cortex, which through simple things like uh, this and that and so on, carry them out. So if I want to lift this up and take a drink, I have to do many things. I have to open my elbow, close my hand, coordinate it with my shoulder, and so on. And what Srini pointed out was that you need, in the premotor cortex, a structure that does this. And he devised a structure that would carry it out and that works, uh, has worked on um, computational models of the body, uh, full of the full body. Now, uh, what he's shown is this that uh, you have a structure for uh, any ac action, a precondition, like an initial state. I have to be close enough to this to take a drink. There's a starting action. I have to come here, I have to pick it up, I have to go to here, and then I am in the pre-central state before actually taking a drink. The central one is to take a drink. Then I have a purpose test. Am I still thirsty? Answer yes. I repeat. Now I'm not thirsty, I finish the action, I put it down, and so on. And then afterwards, I have a consequence, I'm no longer thirsty. Now, actions in general have this structure. And that's where purposes come in. Purposes have structures defined by XNets of this sort. What we discovered was when we looked at this structure for acting and for controlling the neural structure, Sweeney did a neural account of this, what we found was that this structure defines what is called aspect in the languages of the world. So in English, you have a central thing like B plus ing, I am drinking, that's the central action. About to says I'm uh, about to take a drink and so on. I started drinking. I have drunk is the uh, relevant consequence after the final state and so on. And different languages do this in different ways. And what Srini did was do a neural computational model of this in great detail with um, what he called XNets, which are uh, nodes with transitions, uh, and they model neural circuitry in the following way, where the neural cell structure is a node, firing cell clusters are transitions, uh, inputs are input places, outputs are output places, dendrites are input links, axons are output links, and so on, all the way down. And what he found was that you needed to do this not just at the highest level where you have general aspect, but to, for lower level things. Because if I'm going to start to do this, I have to make sure that my arm doesn't go up like this, 
that my hand doesn't go down like that and that I don't hit there and so on. That requires coordination. And what he showed was that there are coordinating circuits that go with these that allow that, that make sure that this is done right. And those coordinating circuits, we will argue later, do a great deal of job in the conceptual system. Now, what is a map architecture? What is it that gives you uh, notions uh, like um, you know, source, path, and goal, uh, things like that, or containment. What is an in? How do you get an interior and outer, an exterior out of the brain? Uh, the basic idea was a suggestion back in uh, 1988 by Terry Regeer, who was then a first-year grad student, who then only followed it up there in part in his MIT Press book on uh, uh, the uh, neural prerequisites for thought. And what, he, uh, what um, he pointed out was the following idea. That a map architecture is a collection of topographic maps of the visual field. A topographic map is usually a, uh, a layer of neurons, though they don't have to be in a layer, uh, that preserve closeness coming in. And the primary visual cortex is a topographic map of what's coming out of the retina, for example. Uh, the, um, you have other topographic maps of the body in the motor cortex, in the somatosensory cortex, and so on. And topographic maps go throughout the brain and the arm, your arms and legs, and so on. They're all over the place. Now, uh, in this map architecture, there's a collection of maps. A triggering map connected to some other brain region or regions. And each map is a collection of neurons that preserves closeness given its input. And it can be closeness of many things. It could be closeness in space. In the auditory cortex, it's um, closeness of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of intensity, closeness of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, of, uh, of frequency and so on. So that you get a frequency intensity map in the brain out of preservation of closeness um, coming from uh, topographic maps uh, of um, the inner ear uh, and so on. Uh, and then the acoustic cortex has, is a topographic map of intensity and uh, frequency. Now, uh, each map is a two-dimensional layout of neurons or nodes, which are neural ensembles. Each map has certain internal connections among the neurons. And each map takes input from or provides output to another map in the collection. And the external connections to the, uh, from one map to another can be either activating or inhibiting. The specific architecture is defined by the internal and external connections and the connections to the trigger. And there's one very general idea. Each role in an image schema, like source, path, and goal, is embodied via one map in a map architecture. So here's a map architecture. This is the motion schema architecture. It's a sort of sloppy version, but I wanted to do it short. Uh, here it is. Region MT, V5, in the parietal cortex has maps that track motion. Uh, now, what's going on here is the following. The sequential activation of neurons in V1 is tracked as a motion in MT. And the proposed architecture looks like this. There's a trigger map, which is movement. In layer one, neurons or nodes are activated next to one another in sequence, tracing a path of motion, one neuron after another, of a moving object that is registered in V1. And in fact, um, if you go to Mike Singer's lab at Berkeley, uh, he has shown that uh, with monkeys, if you flash a light across uh, the retina, you can actually see the activation going from one side of a topographic map to another. Uh, so that's, that's quite real, and it's there. Then, uh, the, in the hypothesized architecture, there's the path of motion map. If you have layer two, which has internal self-activating neurons that stay alive for a while, layer two takes activating connections from layer one. So the motion in layer one will create a line of self-activating neurons staying alive, and this will characterize the overall path given by the moving entity. So we'll call that the path map. The other thing that this can, these connections do is define what uh, Len Talmy called fictive motion. Examples like the road runs through the woods, where you understand a single line in terms of motion tracing that line. Then you have a source map. Well, what's a source map? In layer three, let's say, that's uh, self-activating neurons 
an internal inhibition from each neuron to all the other neurons in the map. So that the first one that's activated in, uh, inhibits all the others, and that gives you a source. Next, a goal map. In layer four, what you have are neurons that have activating connections from layer one, the motion map, but which have thresholds higher than the activations coming in from the normal motion. So that as you move, nothing happens there. The thresholds are too high. But when you stop, you keep getting activation for a while, and that allows you to activate the, one, the goal uh, part of this map. So the idea here is that the architecture is four layers of maps connected in this way, and you get motion, source, path, and goal, one in each map. And uh, that's one way of characterizing the embodiment of a motion schema. Then what about containment, uh, where you have interior, boundary, and exterior? Here's a hypothesized architecture for these, uh, and uh, again, uh, suggested originally as a first-year grad student by Terry Regeer. Now suppose you have layer one. Now boundaries, we know, uh, for both objects and regions are computed in V1. And we hypothesize connections from a V1 boundary to a boundary map in the parietal lobe. Uh, and that boundary map is a neural sheet containing a closed curve of locally adjacent self-activating neurons. So they're next to one another as you go around and they're self-activated, gives you a boundary map. Layer two is a set of self-activating neurons where you have spreading from outside to inside and it's spreading of inhibition. And it starts at the outermost layer and spreads outward to inward. Uh, layer one has activating connections to layer two so that the boundary will activate the neurons in layer two. And as the inhibition spreads inward, it will stop at the activation from layer one. What that will mean is you will get the boundary and interior activated in layer two, but not the exterior. Uh, so that's, that will happen there. Suppose you have layer three. That consists of self-activating neurons receiving inhibition from layer two. So what that will mean is the interior and boundary neurons in layer two will turn off the corresponding neurons in layer three, leaving on the exterior neurons. That will give you an activated exterior in layer three, and layer four will give you self-activating neurons that take inhibition from layers one and uh, layer two, the exterior, and that will leave you with an interior map. So what you have is uh, the semantic roles of boundary, interior, exterior are each embodied by one of these topographic maps in the architecture. Now, um, given something like that, that is you have two kinds of structures. You have the X nets that are embodied by carrying out actions in the world uh, and allowing you to understand those actions when you see them. Uh, and similarly, you have um, a, uh, you know, image schemas carried out by topographic maps and structures of that kind. Those are embodied. How do the embodied structures link up to one another? And the answer is association circuitry. But this is not simple-minded association circuitry where you have just two associations connected. It's actually pretty complicated if you're going to get the structure, the full structure of all of the concepts we know and can not only we do know, but could know. And that's very important. So the question is, how do we do this? The idea here is the following. Uh, we need to, to have what are called cascade circuits that link these things up together. And now let's look at how that, these get formed. The first basic idea is neural recruitment. So the question is, how do we learn anything at all? How do we learn a new circuit? Well, we're born with about 100 billion neurons, about a, which give you about 1,000 to 10,000 connections per. And that gives you about a quadrillion connections, maybe as few as half a quadrillion, something like that. After the pruning of the least used connections in childhood, that, that is half of your neural connections. That'll leave about half a quadrillion connections, which is many more than are used in all of the fixed circuitry in our brains. The extra connections may fire at base rate and stay alive, but they don't play any lasting function. Learning a functional circuit, a circuit that does something, involves the repeating activated of a network of such neural connections that do the same things over and over so that their synapses get strengthened enough to be lasting. That is, when, a, uh, an, when the synapse, syn synapse is active, 
it gets strengthened. This is what is called a usage-based theory of recruitment. It's also a Darwinian theory in which what uh, best fits, not bits, what best fits one's experiential niche is what is learned and what remains. Next, in addition to neural recruitment, there's neuromodulation, which is crucial in everything that we do with cascade theory. Uh, neurons connect across synapses. In firing, the presynaptic neuron releases neurotransmitters into the synaptic fluid, and that they diffuse into the synapse and they bind to transmembrane proteins on the dendrites uh, and cell bodies of the postsynaptic neurons. And they allow those proteins to change shape and open, and they let in positive ions, usually sodium ions. And uh, if not enough neurotransmitters are released, the firing can't take place. That is, you can't get uh, neurofiring. This is what is called a weak connection. But there can be other neurons or neural ensembles with axons that terminate in the same synaptic fluid. When they fire, they can release more neurotransmitters into the fluid, enough to make the weak connection strong enough for firing. This is called neural modulation. And the neurons that modulate are called gates. Such gates can also be inhibitory depending on what kind of neurotransmitters they admit. If they admit neurotransmitters that bind to transmembrane proteins that let in negative ions, like chlorine ions, they can have an inhibiting effect on firing. Then there are cascade circuits that bring all this together. So we hypothesize that there are global neural circuits that can turn combinations of gates in various places in the brain on or off. And we call these cascade circuits since they control the flow of activation and inhibition moment by moment across brain regions. Cascade circuits govern inferences made in simulations in context. And we hypothesize that cascade circuits are bidirectional. They go in both directions with flow going bidirectionally for enough milliseconds for all the inferences to be drawn, but not long enough to be consciously noticed uh, before there is a switch to the next cascade circuit. And consciousness is important here. Uh, in a movie, you have uh, something like um, uh, 25 or 30 uh, frames per second uh, in order to be able to see it as a continuous flow. That means, you know, you have about 40 milliseconds, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, before things become conscious. And the idea, since you have this unconscious thought, within those 40 milliseconds or a little more, you have to be able to activate a cascade with all the structure that it needs before it moves on to the next structure, the next structure, the next structure, and so on. Now, that's what we're studying. To do this, the crucial notion is neural binding. Uh, take the word in. It names an interior location, as in he is in the cafe. And the word to indicates motion with a goal, as in he walked to the corner. The word into binds both concepts together with a goal of motion as the interior of the cafe. And uh, he walked to the corner cafe. Into defines the goal of motion as interior, the source of motion as exterior. Now, in the brain, the motion architecture is in a different location. It's fixed in one part of the brain, container architecture someplace else in another part of the brain. And you don't, not, these guys don't move. They don't move around the brain. You can't put them together like that. So how do you get an into? And the answer is you need a circuit to do it. It's called a neural binding circuit. And, uh, and this is, these things occur all over the place in language. Anytime you have two things that are identified as being the same, you need a neural binding circuit to bring together different parts of the brain. So how do you do this? How do you get that done? Uh, a binding circuit, whoa, went too fast. Uh, a binding circuit links two neural ensembles bidirectionally in two different places so that they fire in sync as long as the gate is firing. So if you have a gate and connections between them and the gate is firing and these guys are firing bidirectionally, they settle into um, a role in which they, s they are synchronized and then the rest of the brain can't tell the difference because they're firing at the same pace. But that will be gated so that when the gate is not firing, this won't happen. That allows in and to to be separate, to be used separately, or to be used together when you have in two. And that is what brings them together. 
So that's the hypothesis about how binding circuits work, and we're trying to work that out in general for all concepts that use binding. And that's going to be an interesting job, but we've been looking at lots and lots of cases, and uh, so far, so good. Now, so uh, we hypothesize that binding circuits can be learned through experience of these things via neural recruitment and normal neural learning mechanisms, which are Hebbian learning and uh, STDP, which is uh, uh, first spike, uh, spike time dependent plasticity. Now, we also have simple neural mapping circuits. A simple neural ma mapping is a gated unidirectional circuit. It occurs with metonymy within a schema where one part of a schema stands for something else. Like we need a strong arm at third base or something like that in baseball uh, where the arm stands for the third baseman which is uh, uh, in the schema. Now, um, metaphor mapping is slightly more complicated. A metaphor mapping is a structured collection of simple gated neural mappings. And they go from one schema mapping in one domain of the one part of the brain to uh, uh, other, another schema in another part of the brain with corresponding semantic roles. And there the gates operate together so that if you have a gate on each of the mapping role to role, you have to have them operating as one thing. And to do that, the gates have to form a gestalt circuit so that the activation of any one of them activates the whole circuit, which activates all of them, and they're all going to function at once as a single metaphor mapping. Now, how are primary metaphors learned? What is a primary metaphor? Imagine a child being held affectionately by a parent, and she feels the warmth of the parent's body when held. Neural circuitry for affection and temperature are simultaneously activated in the child's brain over and over, getting stronger and stronger over time as the child is held affectionately. The activation spreads along existing pathways until the shortest pathway between temperature and affection is found and a connection circuit is formed. Now, when that happens, you're going to get Hebbian learning, which is, can be bidirectional. However, at this point, STDP, that is spike timing dependent plasticity, takes over. The schema that, is regu that regularly fires first has the syn its synapses strengthened in its direction, while the synapses in the other direction are systematically weakened by STDP. This creates asymmetry, the asymmetry we actually see in metaphors. STDP also predicts successfully which schemas are going to be source, namely the ones that fire first, and which are going to be target for the primary metaphors. For example, take this case. Since the brain is always computing temperature, but not always computing affection, more activation uh, will flow from the temperature region, leading to more regular first firing. So uh, that uh, is, explains why it is that affection is warmth, not warmth is affection. Now, the same is true with more is up. That is, verticality is always being uh, registered in the brain even when you're sleeping, but quantity is not. And so if you have connections between them, you're going to have, uh, it's going to go from uh, verticality to quantity, not the reverse. Now, however, notice what's going on there. It doesn't mean it only goes one way. It means it goes more strongly one way and weakly the other. So that if you have multiple metaphors for a given concept, you're going to get some activation for each of the metaphorical paths, though not enough to activate the metaphor. But you're going to get some activation that will help out. <coughs> now, we hypothesize that uh, this is how prim primary metaphors are learned in general. <coughs> Now, and what we've been able to do so far is look at hundreds of cases where the prediction works, which is quite remarkable. Okay, on to complex metaphors. Most metaphor mappings are complex combinations of primary metaphors. <coughs> we hypothesize that these combinations are formed by neural bindings across the metaphors with combinations formed by cascades that turn on the right combinations of neural binding gates to bring these together. 
So that's the general idea of complex metaphors. And the, the system looks like this. There are hundreds of primary metaphors that arise through cases where you have experiences that come together, activating different brain regions over and over, but they do it simultaneously. And there are hundreds of such experiences, and they give an overall structure to the brain, an overall metaphor circuitry that, to the brain. And the complex metaphors take various of these and bind them together because of other kinds of experiences that you have when these fit together, uh, and they're learned. <clears throat> what is a conceptual blend? A conceptual blend is formed by cascades that activate neural bindings, usually together with the metaphors, though they don't have to have metaphors, that, uh, and, that, uh, and they typically uh, activate inhibiting gates as well. The inhibition in a blend results in cases that don't fit the typical frames for metaphors. Take a simple example. Wastebasket basketball. I flip something into the wastebasket. The, there are bindings of rolled up paper. Uh, they are uh, bound to the basketball in the basketball frame. The rim of the wastebasket is bound to the rim of the basketball basket. The throwing of the paper roll is bound to the shooting of the basket, etc. But the strongest activation goes with the wastebasket frame because that's where you are in context. And what that does is uh, it, will, uh, it will do the following it will inhibit anything that is inconsistent with the basketball frame in the basketball frame. So, for example, the fact that the basket is 10 feet tall will be inhibited. Uh, you know, uh, people jumping 10 feet high and dumping, uh, you know, uh, basket things in there will be inhibited. Uh, all sorts of other things uh, will be inhibited. And uh, that's one of the kinds of inhibition that will work in uh, conceptual blends. Uh, what we've been doing is looking at conceptual blends and trying to work out the internal structure of them in neural terms uh, to account for this in terms of neural binding. Now, how are abstract concepts embodied? This is a big deal because we have abstract concepts uh, and if meaning is always embodied, if we get things to be meaningful in the world through our, our uh, our sensory motor systems. How is that possible for an abstract concept? And the answer we give is via embodied metaphor. We know that the meaning of concepts has to be provided by the embodied brain. Uh, it makes fine sense for concrete concepts, like physical entities and physical actions. What about abstract concepts? This is a job that has to be done, and it has to be done by a field of neurocognition. You have to have an answer to the question of how abstract concepts get embodied. And things like, let's say, oh, they just happen to fit the world, or truth conditional semantics doesn't account for it. But also, truth conditional semantics won't account for all of embodied cognition anyway. So the argument here is that they are done via embodied metaphors. How? Uh, and, and what kind of cases? The first thing to understand is that many abstract concepts are physically realized in the brain. Take morality. Morality is about well-being, or well-being and that of the well-being of others. Well-being is registered in the brain via what are called reward circuits. They release hormones, that is neurotransmitters, that make us feel well or ill. They give us well-being or ill-being. Or emotions. Now, emotions, as Paul Ekman pointed out a long time ago and his colleagues have shown, have bodily correlates. For example, when you're angry. Your skin temperature rises, your blood pressure increases, your visual acuity decreases, your fine motor control decreases. These are physical effects. These physical effects are registered in the brain somatosensory system, and they're called somatic markers by Antonio Damasio, who has hypothesized that they are the emotions, that what emotions are in the brain are the somatic markers of the, uh, uh, of the embodiment of those emotions. Now, um, then there are purposes. We saw that in XNETs there is a testing for fulfilling purposes that are carried out. That is, it's a state you're trying to achieve by acting. Uh, thinking is an internal action carried on physically by brain circuitry. These abstract concepts in the brain aren't abstract. They're physical. Next, the theory of primary metaphor learning that we've seen applies to these abstract concepts which are physically real, re realized in the brain. Let's take the very first example of uh, a, um, uh, uh, a conceptual metaphor 
Uh, pointed out by Michael Reddy way back at a conference in 1977, uh, published in 79. The conduit metaphor says that ideas are objects, language is a container for that objects, and communication is sending these idea objects, you put them in language containers, and you send them to somebody else who takes them out of the containers. And he points out over a hundred expressions in, in English for these things, and here are just a few examples. You finally got through to him. The meaning is right there in the words. Put your, wor wor your thoughts into clear language. Your words are hollow, and many, many more. Hundreds of these kinds of cases every day. Now, Eve Schweitzer and Alan Schwartz uh, uh, go take, took this further. Uh, Schweitzer pointed out that there's a general metaphor that the mind is a body, that mental functioning is bodily functioning, and that ideas are objects uh, uh, of bodily functioning. And she pointed out four special cases of metaphors for thinking. First, thinking is moving. Ideas are locations, communication is leading, understanding is following, and uh, you know, understanding is seeing or perceiving in general. Uh, ideas are things seen, communication is showing. Thinking is object manipulation. Ideas are objects, communication is sending as we saw. Understanding is grasping those ideas. Or thinking is eating. Ideas are food, communication is feeding, understanding is digesting. And there are lots of examples of this. Uh, they're discussed in great detail in uh, the book Philosophy in the Flesh by myself and Mark Johnson, where you have things like uh, moving is reaching, you have things like reaching a conclusion, going off on a tangent, say, do you follow me, go step by step. Or examples like seeing, see what I mean. He has a different point of view. Um, that sheds light on what's going on here. This is a clear idea. It's a brilliant idea. That is, it illuminates other things. <coughs> you can pull the wool over someone's eyes. Someone can have blinders on. Then there's manipulation. <coughs> Thinking is manipulating objects. You can turn it over in your mind, toss ideas around, give him some idea, take that idea from him. Eating, you have food for thoughts, raw facts, half-baked ideas. Um, do you digesting, understanding is digesting. Or things like he won't swallow that, it's re rejecting it when you won't swallow it. The point is that you have metaphorical structures and multiple metaphorical structures, not just one, for systems of abstract thought, and very often as many as a dozen or two different, different metaphors for a given abstract concept. Uh, the place to look for this is in Philosophy in the Flesh that Mark Johnson and I put out in 1999. And what we did there was we went through the central concepts that philosophers discuss, namely time, events, causation, thinking and knowledge, the self, morality, and being. And what we showed was that all of them have an embodied metaphor structure that is quite elaborate, and we go through what that metaphor structure is. But we didn't stop there. We asked, what is a philosophy? And Mark Johnson, who's a noted philosopher who has studied this, uh, the history of philosophy in great detail, pointed out that every philosophical system is made up of a collection of metaphors that are taken as true, that are assumed to be literal when they're metaphorical. And what we did there was go through the metaphors used by the pre-Socratics, Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Kant's moral theory, the Anglo-American philosophers, even Chomsky and the rational actor model as used in economics and foreign policy. And in each case, what we showed was that there are detailed systems of metaphor which are taken literally by these philosophers with the metaphorical entailments worked out in great detail by the philosophers, remarkable detail. Then beyond that, uh, Rafael Nunez and I, in 2000, put out a book called Where Mathematics Comes From. And what we did was show that mathematics is based on embodied metaphor as well, but metaphors that are piled one on top of the other, where uh, when you start putting one metaphor on top of another, what happens when you bind them together is that you lose th the sense of metaphor me metaphoricity because the source and target domains kind of cancel each other out and it, everything looks abstract. But what we did was break them down layer by layer by layer, and in full detail, it's about 600 pages of formal detail, and what we showed was that there are metaphorical bases of arithmetic, 
so that we even explain how you could mu multiply by negative numbers. If you think about what it means for mi to do something minus seven times, imagine that. But there's a reason for it. We show how that works uh, in terms of neural cognition. And we go through set theories, not just one set theory. There are hundreds of set theories. The job of a set theorist is to make them up. And we go through some of them. Uh, then we go through the metaphors behind formal logic uh, in general. Then we take the question of what is infinity? And there are two kinds, infinity that goes on and on as in plane geometry, or infinity as a thing, like pi is an infinite decimal, but it's a thing. How can it both be infinite and a thing? And we show that there's a very general basic metaphor for infinity that is easy to learn, it's simple, it shows, it shows up in every branch of in mathematics where infinity is a thing, and there are special cases of that, and we go through the special cases. Then we go through algebra. That is, uh, cases where you have curves that give you uh, map mathematical functions and what the metaphors are there. We go through the metaphors for continuity, for calculus, for infinitesimals, for the arithmetization of geometry, for imaginary numbers, for logarithms, exponentials, and we even take the great equation e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0, and you say, how can that be true? What can that mean? If, if e is an infinite decimal, uh, how can it be raised to the, to, a pi, you know, to the power pi? What does it mean to multiply it a pi number of times? And what does it mean to multiply that a square root of minus one number of times? And when you add one, you get zero. That is, the answer is minus one. And we show that, in fact, logarithms, exponentials, and imaginary numbers are not what is often ordinarily taught. But cognitively, they're metaphorical structures that explain why you can understand this and exactly what it means and why the truth follows from what it means. What we did there was show that every formula has a meaning coming out of the metaphors. Now, what about embodied cognition experiments? These are uh, remarkable things. Uh-oh, uh, forget that. Uh, these are remarkable things. And uh, let me try to give you a sense of them and what explains them. Because conceptual metaphors are physical brain circuits, their activation can act as primes for metaphorical behavior. Think of it, metaphorical behavior. The theory of embodied metaphor explains the results of embodied cognition experiments, and it shows the mechanism by which those embodied cognition experiments work. For example, uh, Tanya Singer and her co-workers in 2006 did a remarkable piece of work. Uh, what they showed was that in physical pain, first uh, the bilateral anterior insula and anterior cingular are active, that's relatively well known, but they're also active in observing the experience of pain in a loved one, but with a stranger the pain reaction in the anterior insula is lower. That is. Basically, the metaphor of psychological pain and physical pain is physically there in your brain. Or take the metaphor of morality as purity, uh, which has to do with the fact that when you eat pure food, you get a sense of well-being. When you eat rotten food, you get a sense of ill-being. And that says that morality is purity and immorality is rottenness, as in something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Now. Uh, Zhang and William Quist in 2006 did a cool study. Uh, their subjects were asked to recall either a moral or immoral act in their past that they performed. Afterwards, as a to token of appreciation, the experimenters offered the subjects a choice between the gift of a pencil or a package of antiseptic wipes. Those who had described an immoral act were far more likely to choose the wipes. In a similar study later, Subjects who either did or did not have the opportunity to clean their hands, uh, they, were, uh, they were able to wash, uh, uh, they were less likely to respond to a request for help. So that if they could wash away, if they could go wash and clean up afterwards, then they're less likely uh, to want to help f in future cases. That is, the guilt, guilt is expunged. That is, washing hands expunges guilt. And, uh, so that the uh, subjects who uh, talked about bad things they had done after they washed their hands saw no need to perform a helping act to expunge the guilt. <clears throat> Other experiments. Uh, the affection is warmth metaphor. Williams and Barge in 2008 did the following. Take subjects in there and they're given warm coffee in advance or cold coffee. 
and they hold the warm cup of coffee or the cold cup of coffee, and then they're told to imagine an individual that you come in, you've never met before, what are they like? And they generally, the people who had the warm coffee said that the um, an imaginary individual was a friendly person, kind of a warm personality, and those who had the cold coffee were less likely to say that. They said that the, the person they met were cold uh, people and not nice to them. Uh, another one with affection is warmth, uh, Zhang and uh, Leonardo Delhi, 2008. Subjects were asked to remember a time when they were either socially accepted or socially snubbed, and they told stories and so on. Those with the warm memories of acceptance then were asked, they were all asked to judge the temperature of the room. The ones with the warm uh, memories of acceptance judged the room to be five degrees warmer on the average than those who remembered being coldly snubbed. Okay, so there you have the metaphor, again, uh, giving you metaphorical behavior. Uh, or the metaphor important is heavy. In 2006, Zhang and Lillian Quest carried out the following experiment. They told students that a particular, uh, uh, that a particular book um, was important, another book wasn't important, and then they were asked to judge how heavy the book was. The important book was judged to be heavier than the unimportant book. Okay? Now, uh, the best one, my favorite of all this, is carried out by two people I know, uh, Spike Lee and Norbert Schwartz. Uh, and what they did was they showed a bidirectional effect with the uh, notion of, uh, that says something smells fi fishy. They took that idiom. And that is what's called an imageable idiom. It's based on an image. Here it's an olfactory image and knowledge about that image. And then the metaphors apply to that, as we will see. Uh, what they did was this. <clears throat> they showed that the smell of fish, particularly in fish oil versus other kinds of oil, created suspicion. And that if, you, if they created suspicion independently, it was easier to pick out the smell of fish from the smell of other, fish oils from the smell of other oils. Is that cool? Now, why? Why does it go bidirectionally? And as we saw that with STDP, it strengthens the mappings in one direction, weakening them in the other, but less than usual strengthening and weakening can produce bidirectional effects. That is, you have STDP, but it's not just all one direction or all the other. Now, how do you get smelling fishy related to suspicion? Why would it be related to suspicion? What is suspicion? Suspicion is an under understanding that someone has acted immorally to thwart someone else's purposes without their knowledge. So it involves the notion of understanding, immoral action, thwarting someone else's purposes without them knowing. That's what's involved. Now, the metaphorical cascade that links that together is given right here. There are three major parts of meta with, with uh, primary metaphors and then special cases of them. So, morality is purity, immorality is rottenness. The experiential basis is in eating pure food correlates with well-being, rotten food with ill-being. Then you have the notion of thinking as bodily functioning and the special cases of communication is sending, thinking is eating, understanding is digesting, understanding is perceiving, the special case is smelling in this case. Then you have achieving a purpose is acquiring a desired object as we've seen and as in uh, that was a plum for the picking, it fell through my the job fell through my hands and so on. You're getting a desired object, I got what I need, wanted. So you have that. The special case here is achieving a purpose is getting desirable food, as in a uh, job is a plum. A difficulty is seen as is, is getting undesirable food. That's an, a difficulty. And the special case is rotten food, in particular, in this case, rotten fish. When you have all of this structure, which is there in your brain, independent of everything else, each piece of this is already there. The cascade, smelling fishy, is, requires a cascade that binds these together, that binds together the uh, gating nodes that gate these things. That's what allows you to have smelling fishy having to do with uh, rottenness, which impedes, uh, uh, which is an immoral act that impedes something you're trying to do. So what's going on there is that it's not surprising that you get the results that uh, this, ha this it gives, it's not just the language here of smelling fishy, it is the conceptual structure, and this is the entire conceptual structure you need, and it's in a cascade that presumably is 
uh, turning on very, uh, the, all the various gating nodes. So, last I want to talk about linear scales. And linear scales are formed by a cascade of neural bindings that is very complex. You have a vertical line where more is up. So that metaphor is structuring that vertical line. So more is up, less is down. You have, in general, a forward motion schema that tells you, and we saw what it was before, uh, there's a, mo a schema for motion, forward motion. There's another schema for backward motion, which we'll get to in a while. Now, purposes, our destinations, is a very common metaphor around the world, where you're trying to reach a destination and things can be standing in your way and so on. There's a general metaphor also that linear scales are paths. And when you have that, so you see that in, in sentences like, he's far more intelligent than Bill. His intelligence goes way beyond Bill, Bill's. So you get goes way beyond, is far. You can see that linear scales are understood as paths. And the mapping there has the bottom is the source of motion, uh, the top is the destination, and the amounts traveled uh, are, the amounts are the distances traveled from the source to some place uh, on the scale. Then you have other notions like good is up, uh, where success is up, where you're trying to reach success, and failure is down. And negative scales are backwards motion. Now, uh, what Narayanan and I did was say, OK, what would be a neural model of uh, positive and negative scales? Notice hard and easy are opposite scales. They go in opposite directions. Uh, things like tall and short are opposite scales, uh, and so on. You have antonyms of that sort where they go in opposite uh, directions. And here you have uh, the um, scale of, uh, for sentence, uh, something like John can solve a hard puzzle. And in the scale, the positive scale is going bottom to top, as you see with the the little uh, rectangles being transitions and the circles being states along the way. So that they range, and you start with the bottom, a mid-range, a central case, uh, the top and so to top of the scale at some point. And they're implicational. That is, if you've gone so far in the scale, then you've gone before. So if you're this tall, uh, then you can do all the rest. If you can solve a problem this hard, you can solve all the easier ones down here. You can't, you know. Now, similarly, for the reverse, for easy ones, the easiest ones, the ones that take like the least difficulty, are way at the at uh, at the top of the easy scale, which is aligned with the bottom of the hard scale. And what happens is that uh, there are implicational relations between those, but also inhibitions across them. So what you have here is a case where you can predict that if you can solve the hard puzzles, you should be able to solve the easy ones, and that comes out of the neural structure. Uh, next, what about um, things like, uh, whoa, uh, no, no, that's the last one of those. That I, here we are. Then what about John cannot solve a simple puzzle? Okay. Well, if he can't solve a simple one, as you're going down the simple puzzle parts, that is, if he can't get the, the, the easiest ones, that, what that's going to say is that that lines up with uh, the bottom of the hard ones. So that if he can't solve a simple one, he, it follows he can't solve a hard one. And this, these inferences come out of the neural structuring that you get when you bind together all of those uh, examples that we gave before for linear scales. That is when you get a cascade and that cascade gives you this structure. Now, uh, here we go. What this does in grammar is something remarkable. Michael Israel pointed out that polarity items are four types. Emphatic positive ones uh, and emphatic negative ones. And positive ones are, he's uh, got tons of money, he's utterly brilliant. Uh, the negative ones, I couldn't sleep a wink, uh, he didn't move an inch, uh, and so on. And they are going on the upscale for high. Then you have the inverted scale that goes the other way. So the emphatic negatives are things like, wild horses couldn't make me do that. I haven't seen you in ages, the uh, inverted scales. And the emphatic po po uh, polarity items are things like, 
He, could, he did it at the drop of a hat, or uh, he'll do a performance at the top of a hat. He did it in a jiffy, uh, and so on. Now, what's important about these is that this has not been able to be characterized in logic. Logicians who have worked on this have not been able to figure out how to do these things in logic, but the neural structure of these gets these straightforward and gets their logics perfectly well and allows you to understand what they mean. Summary. This is a very brief overview of sections of the book of How Brains Think. And this book has many purposes. First, to show how we can get ideas and language out of neurons. Think about it. How do you get an idea out of a bunch of neurons? This is the beginning of how you do it, and we're giving ideas about how that works. Next, we want to explain, get explanations on neural grounds of a wide range of cognitive linguistic phenomena. And we've given explanations for many of them. Where do image schemas come from? Uh, where does aspect come from? Uh, things like that. Where do basic level concepts come from? We can give explanations of those. Next, we want to open up a field of neurocognition as a serious, detailed enterprise, bringing together results in the fields of cognitive linguistics, neuroscience, neural computation, and embodied cognition. Fourth, we want to ground the contemporary account of real reason. We want to replace the 17th century idea with how people really reason. And we want to show how people really, we, we really think. Next, we want to show how neurocognition would change fields, how they would change philosophy, how they change mathematics, the idea of moral philosophy and morality, how it changes politics, economics, and literary studies. And we've been writing about all of these things, and that's a very important thing. And finally, we want to move universities throughout the world toward teaching neurocognition, in particular, the neurocognition of thought and language. These are not really done in the field of neuroscience itself. In neuroscience, you do experiments on relatively small things. Neuroscience is a hard field. But they're not looking at what is going on in what we've learned in cognitive linguistics, in experimental uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, embodied cognition, in neural computation, etc. It requires putting all those fields together and it's important that this be taught because it does change how you think about reason itself. And when you change how, what, what reason is, you change an awful lot. Thank you.